So the All Resource Connect program that we're starting at the FDCA is an initiative that aims to merge our cultural expertise that we have as a community with various other communities that have a technical expertise and are looking to design things for the developing world, um, primarily starting at university levels now, as more and more university engineering schools and design schools are looking to innovate for the developing world if their students uh, lack the understanding of the communities that they're designing for. Uh, we find that our community has this, this expertise in spades, um, and the art platform is going to look to bring those two communities together as well as also promote the best practices um, in technology for development to the broader Peace Corps community. Um, and while I have the mic, I also want to say a few things about what the, the Peace Corps Office of Innovation is currently doing with technology for current Peace Corps volunteers, um, and specifically with links to Silicon Valley. So Facebook's internet.org has been, has been working with the Office of Innovation to try to determine what are the most relevant websites that should be made available. Um, to the rural communities in the participating internet.org countries. They also have been, it was actually a very strategic partnership with the Google Tablets donation because it was something that it was grassroots and something Peace Corps volunteers wanted that they brought to Peace Corps, that Peace Corps wanted to see these tablets, that Google wanted to give the tablets, um, but the donation mechanism wasn't there. And that's kind of where the NPCA came in. So the NPCA was able to facilitate that donation from Google to the volunteers on the ground. Um, and the third one I was going to mention was what Peace Corps has been doing with their, their mapping with open, it's openstreetmap.com.org.net.org. <laughs> uh, in, in the wake of crisis in the developing world, um, mapping the various communities that have been hit by the tsunamis, that have been uh, affected by Ebola. And even in general, what we consider standard Peace Corps practices, malaria eradication efforts. Um, and I think, I think just the whole Office of Innovation initiative by the Peace Corps and the efforts they're putting into that is a good sign on, on how the agency is moving in that direction. And we're looking to complement those efforts the best we can uh, through the NPCA. Yeah, hi, my name is Kevin Bohr. I'm uh, actually currently delightfully unemployed. I um, was working for Yahoo for five years and uh, got caught up in one of the rounds of layoffs. Fortunately, the Peace Corps taught me about being flexible and uh, rolling with punches. So I'm actually thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying my employment. And if you have a stressful job, I highly recommend getting fired. <laughs> but more, to, more to the point here, um, so I was in the Peace Corps in Botswana in 92 to 93. Not a whole lot of technology was going on there, although Botswana uh, did get on board a couple of years later. It's a very wealthy country. I'm sure the story there is completely different now. But the reason that I'm speaking here is because um, for the last couple of years I've been intermittently involved with the local uh, hacking community. Just a question here, who understands, who knows what a hackathon is, a software hackathon? Okay, most people. So the notion of hacking, most people think of it as like Julian Assange, all right? or um, Edward Snowden, where you've sort of illegally gotten a whole bunch of documents, or for instance, hacking is in Russian hackers uh, stealing credit card numbers. This is a completely different kind of hacking. Hacking in the Silicon Valley ethos is when a group of people get together and fueled exclusively by pizza, beer, and, and youthful energy, um, they work 24 hours straight and they come up with a quick and dirty prototype to solve a problem. So there's all kinds of hackathons happening here all the time, and in a couple of them, I've had the pleasure of working with some folks, actually, I believe colleagues or former colleagues of yours, a guy by the name of Patrick Choquette. Is that so familiar? Yeah, he's over at the Office of Innovation. Oh, he's still there, okay, I kind of lost touch with him. So what I thought I'd do, just give two minutes of an example of a hackathon project that we did. Uh, it failed, which is fine. Um, you learn something from failure. Silicon Valley is all about recovering from failure. So the case study was basically this, there's a bunch of uh, rural coffee farmers in Uganda and they all have their crops that are coming uh, ripe at certain times, but they don't own any delivery mechanism, any transportation vehicles, and so uh, the middlemen would kind of show up at the appropriate time and give them a really, really bad price, it's the only price they could accept, and then the middlemen would get a you know, a thousand percent markup by bringing it to Kampala. So really this was an information arbitrage situation where, information asymmetry situation, 
the middlemen know a lot more about the prices than the local farmers do. And so the way that this group got together and, and came up with a prototype in 24 hours, the notion was even in rural areas in many countries, certainly in Uganda, nearly everybody has access to a simple cell phone with SMS. There's very simple technology that you can use to send an SMS message via some software that then gets populated into a spreadsheet. And the notion was at the farmer's cooperative in, in uh, Kampala, they could analyze the data in that spreadsheet and then figure out what route they should send their own delivery drivers on, go to this village on Thursday, this one on Friday, come back on Saturday with a full load of coffee and get better prices for their farmers. And again, as we thought about it, there's probably a use case for that in a lot of places where you have a rural area with at the very least cell phone SMS access to transmit information and you have a capital city with reasonably good internet access and folks that at least know sort of the basics of Excel and can do analysis and decision making. So other fields in which this might work would be possibly uh, the medical field. I know Lai has done a lot of work in that field, um, education, uh, agriculture, all sorts of things. Thank you. Oh, and the reason it failed, uh, quite frankly, is um, we, it, it's very difficult to maintain the energy of these hackathons, all right? Folks are extremely busy, they come all get excited about this, they come spend 24 hours, and then they kind of lose interest. So that's one reason. The second reason is on the ground, there needs to be somebody to continue driving it forward. And one of the problems with the Peace Corps, of course, is that constant churn that makes this kind of, the success on this kind of thing a little bit more difficult. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I'm going to, I'm just sit more comfortable. All right, so a couple of things. I, I, the, the title of this is Bridging Silicon Valley and Peace Corps uh, and, and what's going on in the developing world. Um, when I got into the Gambia, anybody who wanted to do anything in technology had two options. Um, Word Excel, PowerPoint, um, or leave the country for education, and those that were lucky enough to leave never came back. So I went to the university and said, this is stupid, this is brain drain. Uh, they let me build the first computer science major. It's now the third most popular major in terms of graduates after law and medicine. So Peace Corps volunteers can definitely have an impact, but it was not impactful for me to be teaching it. What was impactful for was for me to push them far enough that they couldn't pat, let it go, but not so far that I was the white guy doing all the work. And the students took over, sat outside the door, demanded teachers, demanded books, and that's what made it successful. So to me, the takeaway is, it's not like Silicon Valley where things are handed to you. You have to get them far enough and then let them take over in order for you, it to be sustainable. One of the things that's very difficult in the bridging um, is that in Silicon Valley, we get uh, basically um, uh, almost fat with access to bandwidth, access to power, access to cash. Um, very little cash is going on in the developing world because it's seen as risky and high corruption. Very little uh, power stability. I mean, it would go from 100 to 400 volts and blow things up. When's the last time your computer blew up? Um, it, and the bandwidth would come up and down, and viruses would be everywhere. Some days we wouldn't have enough bandwidth to download the latest virus update, right, in the whole day. And so there's a really big problem with talking about bridging unless you get down to sort of the core problems of uh, technology assumptions. Um, and then I want to talk about the failure. It's really interesting that you led with that because in Silicon Valley, failure is seen as a badge. So I raised money, um, I raised about a million dollars for privacy software back in 99. I know that VC community, and it was very hard for me to raise the money because I hadn't had a failure. Whereas in a lot of developing world uh, countries, um, you very much get branded on a blacklist if you fail, and your team is not employable or not fundable at that point for it. So it's a completely different mindset for how you do it. You have to change failure from a thing that is something that you brag about to something that is hidden inside of a sort of a shell of success, and that's something that's very different. And the last thing, the one thing I really want to plant in everyone's head is my last thought is brain drain. We all talk about brain drain, and then we also talk about maybe funding companies in Africa or Asia or where have you. The problem is that when we fund the companies and they do well, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, they buy those companies and bring the smart talent back here, creating the brain drain, right? So one of the things that I want to advocate for you who are probably the ones who are most likely to be Peace Corps volunteers is when you're doing development projects, make sure there is some kind of tie or advocate for some kind of tie of why you can't leave the country, right? In the funding or in what have you, because it's very often the case that people well-meaning put people in positions.
physicians who are the intelligent ones to change their country who get an offer they can't refuse from an American company and then they never go back. Well, since I have a code, I'll stand up too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I kind of backed into the, uh, the tech industry in around 1990 or so. Uh, and I, I couldn't get the same job I got today. That's, the same job we had back then. I uh, worked for Kaiser uh, for a long time. And when, when the tsunami came along, I, I was watching, seeing my beloved country, you know, fall to pieces, at least part of it where I taught before. Uh, I just threw my hat in the, in the ring for going back. And, uh, and I said, they said, what skills do you have? I was a database programmer, so I, I just threw that in. I didn't expect anything back. I thought, well, they probably need databases there uh, to, uh, to reconstruct them. And, and, and apparently they did, or they thought they did. Uh, I actually have an egg on my face because uh, I, I'm the one who requested this projector, and then uh, I realized I don't. It doesn't have a. I need an HDMI connector, and it doesn't have. So if anybody wants to see what we did, you can see me afterwards, and I've got a little demonstration on my on my computer. But uh, a Peace Corps, I, I have serious problems with what the Peace Corps did with this whole thing. Uh, first of all, the crisis board, I was the only one who, who had a, a definite job. I was, I was sent there as a database programmer, uh, and apparently, I assumed they had requested us, uh, requested me, uh, to track government efforts to uh, reimburse people who had losses during the tsunami. Uh, and they wouldn't, they couldn't tell me anything about what systems we'd be using, or, uh, but they, they said some, they gave me some information about the, the uh, equipment we have, and it all turned out to be complete bogus nonsense. It was like, the situation was nothing like what, what I thought. And I was in a town with uh, three other volunteers who did not have to find jobs. They were called resource developers, and, uh, and that, that's all they knew about their job. Uh, and we were all assigned to the government office there. Uh, and uh, there were four other ones in another town who were assigned to a construction project that was finished by the time they got there. Uh, so everyone had to improvise. And uh, my job, uh, Cam walked in and, and uh, I, I, well, who, who knows about this job, right? You know, who's, who's going to tell me what to do? And uh, they said, oh, what, what's your job now? You know, and, uh, oh, gee, you know, oh, the guy who's handling that, uh, he's on vacation, you know, and he will be back in a couple of weeks. So, uh, so we were all sitting there without, without even knowing what to do, and we kind of came up with, this idea of uh, tracking all the data, all the efforts that were going on. There were like 58 organizations uh, in, in town. They were throwing money at this all from all over the world. And, uh, and so there were just a tremendous number of people in this, in this tiny, in the center of this tiny little area uh, in the mangrove swamps of Thailand. And uh, uh, so we put together a couple of proposals. We got funded and uh, $15,000 worth of stuff. Uh, we had offers from Silicon Valley that fell through, actually, that the Peace Corps office in Washington uh, had, uh, they said, well, they're gonna send you some computers, and they didn't. Um, so, anyway, we had, well, we got all our physical stuff eventually together, uh, but the, the database and the whole things we did with all that money, I would say failure, you know, and I'd say we, we have something to learn from, uh, you know, because it really didn't go and didn't have any impact that I could see. The whole thing didn't. The government didn't really want us there to, they, I think somebody suggested database. Oh yeah, we can use a database guy. Uh, but what they really wanted, uh, what they ended up doing was creating a fictitious, num fictitious numbers uh, and writing them down in Word, uh, Word documents and sending them into the main, uh, you know, the main office in the provincial capital, and, uh, and that, that was their duty, you know, they never used what I, what I tried to give them. Uh, and they, and, you know, for all, all the, the, we tried to set up a tsunami center, and it just kind of never got used. We were sending people, we wanted to send people out uh, into uh, the villages to find out what their needs were, come back, put these in the database, and then report out what different people were doing. Uh, and it just really didn't, you know, was, it, I, I have to say it was a failure. It was great to be there. It's great to see all this going on. But, uh, you know, learn from your failures. And I don't think Peace Corps paid the slightest bit of attention. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe somebody will raise their hand now. Okay. <laughs> so that's me. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Jane Lee. This 
whole idea of bridging Silicon Valley um, and Peace Corps, um, part of that came uh, it was a conversation Meredith and I had. Um, what happened is my whole world has been tech. I, I did, took two years off to do Peace Corps, and then um, I was actually on leave of absence, but then I came back. I mean, I love tech. A lot of times, you know, lot, plenty of years, I would rather, you know, code than eat. So, I like to eat. So, <laughs> having said that, I was at the Google Plus uh, a while back, and um, it was all about what people were doing in Silicon Valley and around, you know, so tech writ large, because this was actually a guy coming out of, the, of Europe, uh, what they're doing to help the developing world. And um, I could see completely, it was like so insensitive, it would never work. And I'll, after I tell you what it is, you'll see why. It wouldn't even work in the United States. What it was, you had this great little program, and what it would do was to tell you where there were uh, flaws in earthquake construction. And he was going to teach uh, young junior high school girls, why girls, I don't know. He was going to teach them how to critique construction around their town, probably done by their uncle or some other, <laughs> right, right, some other older man? I mean, good idea, good idea, you know, right? And so I'm kind of like, okay, 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 we gotta get Peace Corps into this. Because if there's one thing I think Peace Corps people really know how to do, you can sit still in, while there's a meeting going on, or, or I mean, you guys can, three, four hours, you know, eat the chicken wings or one feet or whatever they give you, right? And that's what you have to do um, to do it. And so then, fast forward now. So a lot of stuff happened. I started talking to Peace Corps, USAID, all kinds of stuff. And bottom line, it kind of came to that if it's going to happen, I'm going to have to start my own company. And that was like the last thing I wanted to do. I already have a company. Last thing I wanted to do was start another one to do this, but it's, it has come to that point in my life where I need to re-merge that, that, that part of myself with my tech life. So, so now, cut, again, cut long story short, I, I'd love to, I, I'd be happy to talk more about it to anybody. Right now what we're doing, turns out we're focusing on Africa in particular. One of the big problems is broadband access. Um, for example, we just put in a proposal to, you might have heard people talking about Paul Allen, he's the co-founder of Microsoft. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work in Ebola. Just last week we put in a proposal to him to build an emergency infrastructure for the Ebola countries. And one that I, I mean it's my proposal so I think it will work. And basically the idea is internet broadband on wheels. We'll just go, we'll do circles you know, like bookmobiles around to all the villages with broadband. And as I say, yes, I know it's expensive. Don't get me started on how we're going to reduce the price, et cetera. But it's a, that's a methodology that I think will work in a lot of African countries. In fact, we've got people in Uganda waiting for us to do that in Uganda. So I'm trying to raise money. That's kind of where I am. And, then, and we also help, uh, have signed a partnership with Cambridge University Computer Labs, you know, in the UK. They're the ones, they were responsible for the original design of the Raspberry Pi, if you guys are familiar with that. Two, that. two million units in two years after they went public, you know, after they started producing it. It's a very, very cheap uh, thing. They say $35, I'm gonna say $70, and you can have a working, you know, a working version. Adorable, cute as they come, you know, wonderful, wonderful. And, and they're very, very I, as I, said, I can't thank them enough, they're very, very supportive of trying to do this kind of development work um, and, and to try to get broadband um, in, as I said, I don't want to get into the engineering of, of trying to make that affordable, but that's one of the big issues right now. And, I, and I, I can tell you, I mean, it's like, you know, people in Uganda are like saying, when are you coming? I've had people from um, other African countries saying, can you help us get jobs using the internet? Um, people in the islands, um, Grenada, I mean, I mean, broadband is so expensive, and in a lot of ways, yeah, I know cell phones are cute, but if you really want to do stuff, if you really want to get there, you need broadband, and how can you provide it? And that's the niche and the hole that we're trying to fill. And, um, it, you know, as I say, I, that, that's enough for me. I would love to talk to anybody who'd like to afterwards.
Thank you. I mean, I think all of us from our Peace Corps experience hearing our panelist stories, we all know there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of failures. And I know in Silicon Valley, that's a mantra like a badge of honor, great, a failure, I thrive. But as Lai said, there are some you know, different mindsets and cultural relativity and adaptation that needs to be taken into account that it, you know, the Silicon Valley mindset may not be what you find in your village in Gambia. And we need to be very aware of that. And um, one of the things that I find living in Silicon Valley, maybe the only non-tech person in Silicon Valley, I fish out of water, but is the sense that we need to bring technology to the developing country, right? We're aware that there's accessibility issues, we're aware there's broadband issues, there's a variety host of issues that are a challenge, but the solution is usually bring the tech to the developing country. And we hear a lot of problems. And what I'd like to, to ask our panelists is I view the Peace Corps volunteers as a solution. You heard from our corporate leaders panel, Peace Corps volunteers have a very amazing mindset. They're, they have the grit and the agility, as I believe it was Meg said. So I'd like to ask our panelists what you think we can do, not just bringing Silicon Valley to the developing countries, but how can we bring the, the resources and the knowledge that Peace Corps volunteers have back up the chain in a way that has, uh, you know, an ROI. And um, it's kind of a self-centered pitch here. My brother happens to be, um, was the founding CEO of Tony Lulu's Fund. They're doing some very interesting things. Uh, so is Patrice Motsepe in uh, South Africa. There's a couple of folks in, in Eastern Europe, that, in Eastern Africa that are also doing it. So I think what's gonna be increasingly hap happening is rather than us uh, incredibly smart and generous uh, generally Caucasian people, frankly, out here in Silicon Valley, bestowing our knowledge and our wealth onto the, the impoverished masses, it's actually going to be the exact opposite. It's going to be folks like, like Tony Lumulo saying, hey, here's a market that we figured out, it's worth $15 billion, here's what we provide, we're looking for this kind of development in Silicon Valley, we're going to come here and we're going to buy the right company for $55 million in developing it. I can guarantee within five years, at least 50% of the, of the really creative uh, projects that are going to produce a lot of ROI and social benefit in third world countries are going to be ones that are going to come from the idea and the money is going to come from the third world and they're going to come here only when they need the skills that they don't currently have. Um, so the, the, you kind of lose perspective, you know, it is, it's, it's daunting. There is a tremendous amount of wealth and for me it's not about the dollar signs, it's how do you use it well and appropriately. And to put a human face on this, I want to bring it back down to the Peace Corps volunteer. Some of you may have done tech work overseas while you were in your service or after. Um, but think about PCVs and their villages that want to build up local knowledge and harness you know, the local infrastructure and build local capacity. What can we do as a community to support those Peace Corps, Peace Corps volunteers? I'm a native Californian and I was uh, director of Adam Harvey program when uh, Silicon Valley was still the twinkle in entrepreneur's eyes. <clears throat> so I've <clears throat> been involved with it. One contribution that you may not be aware of is a contribution made by the founder and former president of eBay. And he formed a group called Social Entrepreneurs, or at least that, that's, that's what he created. Uh, I was one of the first RPCBs invited to, uh, to join him in that venture. And you know, uh, indigenous people in developing nations don't have the, the luxury of the time to do volunteer work. But when you create situations where they can uh, do well by doing good, uh, then you've got a win-win situation. And that's also the way for them to come up the way so many people in our society do by doing volunteer work, volunteer organization. They learn and then they go on to become um, paid and, and directors and things like that. Uh, I have to work, uh, I was director for the Antipartment Program for Central California for a number of years and then <clears throat> helped found the uh, Silicon Valley um, Entrepreneur Center, which was considered one of the finest of its type in, 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 in the whole nation. So we have made contributions and, and the, the computerization, the learning of computers in uh, Africa and you know, some other developing nations was largely came from Silicon Valley campus. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm always glad to hear when RPCBs are engaged in critical things. Thank you, because I know they direct things in the right direction. 
Would you point that at me while I'm talking? It's already on. Even then, you still need the beauty of the keyboard. And yeah. you can even yeah. give me the screen. I can you can, you, I, you I can put a digital keyboard on this, and I can extend it with You can extend it with the screen. Yeah. You can so extend then, like, it. We, yeah. then that will all happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question right here, please. So, my name is Bill Lewis, and I'm 7476. I was a uh, professor at uh, computer science at Stanford for a number of years, and uh, some microsystems. Tufts, MIT, so I mean, all good set of things there. My observation of the people that I work with in northern Kenya and my subsequent observations of people who are suffering worse in the world is that you know, technology isn't the question. The question, the major questions that I see are stop killing us, stop dealing, stealing our houses, stealing our land, poisoning our water, poisoning our air. We want healthcare, education, housing, uh, literally all the stuff that you get for free in Cuba. I just came back from a trip to Cuba with Code Pink. And so I'm looking at our panel here and the question, I'm going like, wait a second, I don't think this is what, I, mean, I love the technology overall, there's so many wonderful things, but what the people need is they, more than anything else, they need the ability to be democratic, establish their own freedom so that they can determine their own futures as opposed to having you know, capital impose upon them the, the oppression that they suffer from right now. So there's a generalized question, comment, criticism. <laughs> the short version is that it's chicken and egg and you're looking at it back. It's, it's education that stops the killing, not the killing that brings education. Come on, Silicon Valley can solve all of those problems. <laughs> if, if you bring the education and the money in, people aren't going to let themselves be oppressed, right? Look at every historical overthrow. It's from countries that have food and education. The money needs to come first. So you can't stop the killing until the education comes. Unlike Cuba, which did exactly that. And you guys need to have a conversation afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have five well, minutes in the Q&A. Well, right. Let's not teach English either. It's not, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's like, you know, what do we advocate? Is, is CIA overthrow of all government because we know best? You know, yeah. yeah well, I was just going to point out another RBCV that his name is Michael Butler, who we developed, you know, an app back here, created like a Groupon that, you know, you get discounts when you go to restaurants and then after you get that discount it asks you if you want to make a donation and those donations don't go to a Peace Corps volunteer in RPCV. It goes to an RP, a community where there was a Peace Corps volunteer but they're now doing projects. These are the communities that did projects with the Peace Corps volunteer, know that they can do things on their own and say well we want to build out our school this way. We want you know a latrine here. This is all community driven with no middleman. So I think even in this instance like we're seeing great things being done by RPCV is using technology back here to help further along like the agendas like, of the people in their community. Uh, Kevin, brief response, and then I'm going to go to Karen. We only have a few minutes, so let's try and keep our comments brief, please. We're, we're running out of time, so I'll just suggest, could you and I have a talk afterwards? And the lady in the back was talking about cell phones. Um, I have uh, 18 ideas brewing in my head on how we can solve every problem you said using the technology you're talking about. <laughs> That's what I want the session to be, is I really need you guys to stick around after and engage, because there is way too much to discuss in five minutes. But Karen, give it a shot. Okay, um, Cherry Cal has $99 computers that were built specifically for poor, develop poor developing countries. Um, they are solar powered as, and sand resistant, wind resistant, whatever. Um, it's a German company. Um, they will not sell it to anybody except poor people. In, in these countries. But I'm wondering about China. I don't know how much broadband costs to put into a country or whatever, but um, what about China and India? They are really moving forward and we are not competing with them. So uh, do you have any ideas on how we can compete with them? Because they give stuff to the people, teaching them so that they get the returns. Yeah, this is the common misconception because you hear all this China, China, India, India. What's the last piece of software you've written that you've used that was written in China, right? So if anybody wants to come comment on the challenges of the woman from LinkedIn was talking about being a tri-sector athlete. We all need to speak two to three languages, for-profit, non-profit, public. 
everything, what your experience is. Yeah, uh, go to LinkedIn, do a search for RPCV, given technology, done. Any, let's talk afterwards after. He's saying anyone who's served in the country can be your translator. Is anyone here from Stanford City? City. No one here? There are some programs that, and I do, I live near Stanford, I do not work with them, I'm not that familiar, but I know they are one of the sponsors, and they are working a lot on building African entrepreneurship. Um, so I don't, no one here is from Stanford. So uh, I'm from TechSoup Global. You don't, you're not familiar with TechSoup. We provide um, technology at a very, very low cost, almost free, to um, most countries in the world. In July, we'll be in 240 countries and territories. And, and we don't go and bring the technology to the developing world directly. The developing countries have their own tech soup. We have 61 tech soups around the world. I'm from the 62nd tech soup, and that's in San Francisco. Um, but to answer your question, we are collaborating with tech, uh, Peace Corps. So we hope to have Peace Corps volunteers have in their training manual that they have um, this resource to go to in their own country, not TechSoup in San Francisco, but TechSoup in Kenya and South Africa, Colombia, um, and then we're in developing, but we're in developed countries too, France, Japan, uh, etc. But we're also uh, collaborating with um, what Meg says is that you know it's not just the Peace Corps volunteers, but it's that when you return, you have all of this passion, interest, and a little more wealth than you had than before. So we are collaborating with currently like our PCVs and the Net Squared program of TechSoup as well. So I hope to collaborate a little more with NPCA and not just with Peace Corps, but I know we've been working with Gabe from the Office of Innovation. And I've been working with Chris from TechSoup. Yes, Chris, Chris is, yeah, Chris works with me. I talk to him every day. Yeah. And I, I have a session tomorrow that I'm meeting on um, what I'm doing by myself on Tech for Good. If you want to hear more? Great. Thank you. That's